Welcome back to Doctor and Forensics. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about normal. As a Christian, after we cross over into the beautiful salvation provided to us by our Lord, it is easy to forget what our normal condition was before Jesus. Now, what I mean by forgetting is that we lose the appreciation of the saving work of the cross of Jesus and just how miraculous it is. In the next three upcoming podcasts, this series called Normal, That's Normal, and A New Normal, we're going to discuss what the Bible says about our normal condition before salvation, what happens when we become a Christian that becomes normal, and then what a new normal is, which is walking by the Spirit, and displaying the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this series is designed to help aid in spiritual growth and understanding. So, Brother Anthony, Chris, and I hope you come along for this three-part series called Normal, That's Normal, and New Normal. We're going to get into part one in just a second. Well, welcome back to Doctor and Forensics. It has been a few minutes since we've had a chance to get together and do a podcast, and that we collectively is Brother Anthony and Brother Chris, who I have on the line, and we're excited today because we're going to launch out into a new three-part series. I'm going to withhold the title for a second Uh, because I have to build a little bit of a runway, but before I get to that, let me just uh, welcome in. Brother Anthony. Good morning, Brother Anthony. Hey, Brother Sean. How you doing? So glad to be with you and Brother Chris. And, you know, I was over here laughing when you said it's been a few minutes. You know, we just used to saying it's been a minute, but when you dropped it, it's been a few minutes. But I'm so glad to be with you all. And I was so glad to be back with you all, the subscribers to Doctrine Forensic. Amen. Blessings. It's good to hear your voice. Everybody's sounding well. And in the state of Louisiana, Brother Chris, good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing and an honor to be back on one more time. Thank God for this day and his goodness and his mercy. I'm glad to be here. Yes, we are. I want to in particular take, take, thank Brother Anthony because he has been a great statesman. He has been speaking with a lot of the subscribers that have been listening, in particular our podcast. And the feedback is encouraging because we're not doing these podcasts for our glory. We're doing them for the glory of God. And what we're realizing is that in our conversation with you on air, there are nuggets and people are learning things that are turning their hearts and minds towards God. And so for that, we say amen and hallelujah. Let God be praised. Today, we get to launch out into a series of teachings that we're going to call Normal, that's normal, and new normal. Now, here in our world, everybody's talking about the new normal. Well, if you can set aside your COVID-19 mindset for just a second, we want to approach this from a spiritual perspective. About nine years ago, uh, when I lived in Houston, I taught in a very large megachurch, and I taught a series called Normal, That's Normal, and New Normal. And The purpose of that series was reminiscent of what we just completed. Um, If you've been following the channel, you know that Brother Chris and Anthony and I finished a three-part series um, that was called um, You Must Be Born Again, What What the Gospel Is and What the Gospel Is Not. We had part one, part two, part three. And from that particular group of of teachings and um, videos, we felt like we needed to dig down and be a little more granular. Um, because, boy, would it have been helpful if we would have had a brother or a sister um, to your left and to your right when you become a newborn Christian to help you have a better biblical perspective. And one of the things that we're going to deal with today in the first part is called normal. It is so easy, as I talked to Brother Chris and Anthony, for us to forget just how spectacular and miraculous it is to actually have our sins forgiven. And if you've been a Christian for any given time, um, 
months, whether you've had great growth or no growth or a struggle in your growth, it is very easy to get distracted by the false gospel, the prosperity gospel, the name and acclaimant gospel, and forget that the greatest miracle that ever happened was the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. There's nothing greater than that. So we need to stop for a second and look backwards so that we can appreciate how we're going to move forward. So this first part of the series called Normal is exactly that. We wanted to just remind ourselves how great the salvation that God has given us so that we could actually be more respectful and give more reverence to our Lord God in heaven. So with that, I'll yield the mic to whomever wants to jump in. Brother um, Sean, I'll, I'll be real brief. I was listening to you talk, and I, I agree with everything you said, but there was something, a thought that came to me that the Lord ministered to me some time ago, and I just want to share it briefly, and it is not the foundation of what we're doing, but it would add to what we're doing. Um, there's a lingo that we use in the world of believers that we refer to everybody that named the name of Christ Christians. And I feel that that is a starting reference to the problem that we're having to the what you would call the normal. People chant that name, and when they say that, they feel that they have arrived because they can identify with just that name of saying, I'm a Christian. And we forget about the sin man and the aspect of everything that encompasses salvation. And that within itself has been a lead to deceiving a lot of people of what it really means to be saved and what it means to accept the redemptive work, what it means to go through, to be transformed, to actually walk through what God requires us to do in the life of believers. So the reason why I'm saying that is when you make the statement Christian in, in reference of what we're talking about, the normal, that's something that's normal for everybody once they um, go through what they call the steps of salvation. And then they say, okay, now I'm a Christian, and they forget about working on their soul salvation and laying aside every sin and weight, which so easily encompasses them. And they forget about working on the mind. They forget about being transformed. They forget about being renewed. And then they're still struggling and fighting with the sin man and with the sin nature and with everything that's going on because they simply say, hey, I'm a Christian now, and that's it. And uh, that's just something I wanted to add in. I know that's not the cover of the text, but we're talking about the normal. And in what we're talking about, that particular word, I feel, is an element that is a part of the problem and what we're facing in the lives of the believer and them being deceived. Because once they say it, then it's done now. Hey, I'm a Christian, and they identify with that. And then we go on with business as usual, and we forget about what the Word tells us about what we need to do. We're working on the sin man. Well, you know, Brother Chris, before I slide over to Brother Anthony, I have to tell you that that is a part of this conversation. That is such a big part of the conversation because there's a lot of people that think if they go into a church or their mother and father have a heritage of going to a church, and because they do things that are good, that makes them a Christian. That's that normal mindset that is unfortunately unregenerated and demonic that most people find themselves in, and, and, and this is, you know, we're already five minutes into this, and it's already, it's already a rough airplane ride, but strap <laughs> in, because, it, thank you, Brother Chris, it, you, you're right, it is, this is a rough airplane ride, because if we don't take the time to completely uh, unpack the scriptures to know if we are truly in possession of eternal life by way of how the Bible says you obtain eternal life, then then basically everyone's going to be lost. And and I agree with that, it's what you said, Brother Sean, because it is a part of that. And I love what you said, Brother Chris, and it's the thing that is missing so much in the walk of those of us who are supposed to be believers, but we fall underneath the thing of Christianity, you said what God requires of us. 
And that's the part that many of us who pronounce the name of Christ, that's the part that we're not willing to walk with of what he requires. And in that requirement, and we would get into it, but that was huge. And then I love what you said, um, Brother Sean, that, you know, it's a rough ride. In other words, this is why we have so much turbulence in our lives because we are for professing something that we're not walking in alignment with. And that is why our lives become so turbulent, this rough rise. And when you think that that airplane should come in the clear, it's just a whole ride. And when I remember when my wife, we were coming um, back from Paris, and we had a long patch of turbulence. I mean, this was about for 10 minutes of turbulence. And it was a lady sitting next to us who had a little daughter, and because of the ongoing turbulence, the baby became ill and sick. And this is what happens when our lives are just one that, if you will, of being initiated into becoming a Christian mm-hmm. versus of living it out and walking and doing what is required of you of taking this sacred thing. Because you said it's so beautiful, Brother Sean. We undervalue the miracle of what Christ did for us at Calvary. Yes. Yes, we do. We do. And you I, know, in the I, book, in the book, of, go ahead, Brother Chris. No, you you finna go to Titus three and three, and after you bring yeah, I was I was going there. You were going there too. I mean, go ahead. I'll let you have it. Go ahead, because what I was fixing to say about that scripture, um, if you look at what Titus three and three said, you you have it plain. It says, "For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful." and hating one another. And it's sad to say that's what's happening throughout the world. I mean, yes. you look at what's happening with the Black Lives Matters, you look at what's happening in the Middle East, I mean, that's what is happening. The heart of man is sinful and evil. Now, if I, we were on a stage right now, this would probably be the part I get fruit and vegetables thrown at me in the spirit realm for what I'm fixing to say. But the truth is right, nevertheless. And <laughs> you take, I mean, just just bear with me on this, and I'll, I'll try to make this as quick as possible for time's sake, the analogy. If you take uh, what happens in the name of Christianity, I'm talking about every reformation and every dogma that has created a s- infrastructure and remove Christianity from it. Let's just take that out of it and then just set the action of the people there, what they do. And then you take what Christianity points at and say is a bad religion like Islam or Hinduism, and let's remove what that umbrella and just set the people there. At the end of the day, without the label of these um, religions or dogmas or umbrellas, the heart of men is still the same. It's evil. It's wicked. They both promote wickedness. They both promote sin. And at the end of the day, God is not pleased with none of them. So what am I saying here? If you're going to label yourself as a child of God, Jesus said it plain. Why call me Lord and don't do what I say? How can you identify yourself with Christ and still have hate? and malice toward your brother or your sister because of a skin color, no matter what the skin color is, or because of a view or political or whatever the difference is, the prejudice is, there's hatred there. There's no unity and there's division. So I'm saying that to say just by labeling yourself and saying that identify with the word Christianity does not qualify you to be a child of God because Titus 3 it laid it out plain that sometime that some of us that are saved, we were like that. And there are some that are naming the name of Christ, they're still like that. So how right. do we get from that normal of sin, of what we did every day for however long, however many years you've been on that earth, to get to the part to where Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus, is pleased with our life, to where we can hear him say, job well done, my good and faithful servant. What it, what does that look like in the eyesight of a true believer that is really working on his soul's salvation every day, that is coming away from Titus 3 and 3 
that's moving into that part of God is now he's pleased with me. What must that person do to hear that from the Lord? Amen and amen. And you know, Brother Chris, what you said is profound because anyone who has become a true child of the Most High God, they had to come to the acknowledgement of their sin. It's amazing to me how many people will preach a gospel will have no mention of the importance of repentance and being aware of the fact that you need a Savior. Titus 3, three says it so well. And for those who are listening, a real quick check, check test is this. If you're having the same conversation with the same people, you're doing the same things that you've always done, you have the same reactions and the same behaviors to anyone who says anything to you. You're defensive, you're mean, you're evil, you're hateful, but yet you call yourself a child of the Most High God. You should question whether you really are a child of the Most High God because those normal behaviors, if they're still present in your life, puts you in jeopardy because the new life in Christ will bring about change, but it doesn't bring about change without effort. And Anthony and I talk about that all the time. Now, we don't have to earn our salvation, but the putting off of the resisting of the temptation and being able to go to the Lord and be transparent about the things that we love more than we love him absolutely has to become a daily practice of anyone who wants to follow the Lord. All right, and, and, and everything that is so good, I'm so grateful that um, we're taking the time to go back to the basis because once we have confessed or accepted Christ, but once again, as we said with John chapter 3, this confession and acceptance of Christ cannot be done with your carnal mind saying, I give my life to Christ. Let's be very clear because what you said, Brother Sean, is so true. We cannot talk about the great works of Christ without highlighting the presence of sin because that's why Matthews 1 and 21 says, For you shall call his name, you shall have give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And for us to walk this life of sin that we are now redeemed back unto God, and yet we continue to live that same old life that we once lived, then that has to become, raise up a question. Now, granted, as I was telling Brother Chris this morning, Many people say, well, you can't question my salvation. Well, you're absolutely right. It's not for me to question your salvation, but God's word says a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. So if we right. are producing fruit, having the same ideology, the same mentality that is reflective of the world, which is enemy to God, it's not me that's questioning your salvation. It's the word that is bringing conviction. And so this That's is right. the antidote that we can give the people who say, well, you can't question my, my, my salvation. Well, you're right, I can't. But God's word says, so is the fruit that you're producing, is it in alignment with the lifestyle and character of who Christ is and what God demands and requires of us? And uh, before I toss it right back to you all, I just want to just add to it. You know, I'm looking, and I'm looking at just the um, definition of normal. Definition of normal says conforming to a standard, usual typical or expected. And another one says the usual, the average, or the typical state or condition. Many of us who are pronouncing and proclaiming the name of Christ, we are still living with that old man mentality that was there before we came into the connection of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a problem. Because my cousin, uh, Marvell, she used to have this women's conference called A Change You Defines a New You. Mm -hmm. And if you have really come into connection with Christ, your way of how you used to think just becomes an old way. But as we've been saying, you have to now begin to work out your salvation. And let me tell you something. That old man is not going to go away without a fight. And the only way that you can fight to resist that old man is through the word of God. That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, to back up to something that Chris was talking about, you know, we're talking about, you know, people who name the name of Christ, you know, in an, in an aggregate Pew Research study um, in 2019, it shows that, quote, unquote, Christianity in the United States 
is actually on the decline. So that creates a problem. And the problem it creates is we have so many people that are saying that they're Christians, but we don't have people that are practicing true Christianity. Um, it's amazing to me when we watch, you know, award shows. It's the Grammys. It's the Dove Awards. It's all of these awards. And everybody who halfway gives God, well, we, not, not the God of heaven. They give God credit, but it's not the God of heaven. I want to thank God. Okay, which God are you talking about? I want to thank the Lord Jesus. Well, which Jesus are you talking about? They're not talking about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But we, and the Christians and the sheep, are so quick to run behind somebody because they had some epiphany or some type of moral correction in their life, and they stick a label on that called Christianity. And that's actually them just shifting and merchandising themselves. Because the most gullible group of people, in my opinion, in terms of consumerism, are Christians, people who call themselves Christians. They're just too nice. They're, we don't use biblical discernment, but we're willing to let anybody into the sheepfold. And that is not so with the Lord. If you read the book of John, chapter 13, 14, and 15, when the Lord talked about people coming over into the sheepfold and they crawl over, those are the ones you have to watch for because everybody has to come through the gate. And narrow is the gate and straight is the way. And you have to come to the Lord one way. No one's actually going to see the face of the Most High God without coming through Christ, and there aren't any other ways. So I'm very confident when I talk to atheists and people that have other things that they believe, I can look them straight in the eye without any conflict and say, what you believe is going to lead you to Satan's hell. And what is it, what will happen if what you believe is not correct? And you should just look sometimes at the look in their eye because these people have convinced themselves that all roads lead to God and that God's going to have mercy upon people who hate him. And we all know that's certainly not true. Certainly not true. Um, so I'll yield back. And Brother Pastor Sean, you said a mouthful, you and Brother um, Anthony both. I enjoyed listening to both of y'all, but there was something that came to me while you were talking, and you dropped a bombshell, man, when um, you included Galatians five seventeen and 21 in um, the discussion of the topic of what we got going on today. And if you look at that scripture, the end part of that, after reading that, it gives a list, a checklist um of who's not going to make it in. And if you go back and read that, and if you can find yourself in any one of those sins, then you're not going to make it because he made it plain and clear at the end of that. He said, and those that which practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he was right. clear, is not left with any wandering it's a clear-cut instruction. If you are in this line, then you're not going to heaven. Bottom line, you're not going to make it into the kingdom. And That's in right. Romans 12 and 2, he told us, real plain, he told us to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So salvation is progressive. So since salvation is progressive, that means we should be continually moving forward and growing in Christ. That's why he identified us once we have been born again as babies, desiring the sincere milk of the word. It's a growth process. And I think where we are missing it as believers, that we think that once we went through that motion, that it's a standstill thing, it's a stamp of approval, that's done, and there's no more work to do. It's like we've purchased a membership of something and we don't a lifetime membership and we don't have anything to do we've got it we put it in our wallet we can put it up now and it's valid up and throughout eternity well that's not the case we have to put forth <laughs> some effort and there's some work we got to do and if we don't do it according to the word of god corinthians 2 uh second corinthians 5 and 17 tell us therefore if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, but behold, all things become new. That means there should be a change in your life. You shouldn't look the same way. There's something wrong um, 
with a person, if you find a 40, I'm 47 this year, 47-year-old man still the size of a three-year-old toddler running around with diapers with a binky in his mouth, <laughs> calling my mom and daddy. That, yeah, that's, that, that would be a problem. That, that's, a, that's a problem. That's that a, a that's growth process that a child goes through. Right. And he grows into adulthood, whether it be male or female. So the same way spiritually is so there's a problem when someone has been saved for some time and they are still in that same rut. Uh, there should be some growth somewhere is what I'm trying to say. You sh- if you're still in the same place, doing the same thing like you alluded to earlier, Pastor Sean, then there's a good chance you're not making it into the kingdom. You're not going. And the whole purpose of this podcast is if we can see ourselves and hear the truth of the Word of God and say, hey, this is Amen. me, Lord. Save me. Change me. I've been going about this wrong. And by his mercy and by his grace, he's given us an opportunity to get it right. Then, hey, this is the opportunity to take it. Because you know, uh, as well as I know, that um, Christ, Lord Jesus, he said it himself in Matthew 25. He said, not everyone, Christ said unto me, Lord, Lord, going to make it into the right. kingdom. And then he said, right. but they that do the will of the Father. And he turned around in Philippians 2 and 5, and he told them, he told us, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what was Christ's mind? To please the Father. That was his yes. goal. That's what he was here for. That's what he did. That's what he's doing right now. So that should be our ultimate goal. Not our own selfish means, our own selfish desire, but what does God say I should do and how does he say I should do it? And that should be our ammunition for moving and living right. Hey, hey, Brother Chris, if you you don't mind, could you please expound to the people what does it mean, how can we go about in pleasing the Lord? Because somebody could say, well, I just heard you say, Brother Chris, to please the Lord. So could you share with us in the listening audience what is needed to please the Lord? What are some ingredients? What are some actions, if you don't mind? Because we want to make this very plain and simple for all of us to grasp and understand. Well, the Scripture says, um, how shall a young man cleanse his ways but by taking heed to the word of God that's plain and simple in a nutshell from Genesis to Revelation God has given us a clear cut instruction for a way to live and you can pick the book you want to start reading in but each book of the Bible is full of richness full of nuggets full of an Enlightenment full of instructions for our lives. It's a plain and simple action. You have to study. He told us to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that need not be made ashamed. That means you have to take the time to spend time with God. You have to spend time praying. You have to fellowship with him. You just can't put him on a back burner and say, hey, I've, I've said the uh, what well, has been wrongly alluded to as the sinner's prayer and now i got it together and it, it's so scary to me man i've i've heard some things in my lifetime that people really think classify them as being saved i've had somebody tell me i know i got it i shook the preacher's hand i'm like whoa where is that at in the word of god i've had somebody else tell me i know i'm saved i've been water baptized I just said to myself, went down a wet devil, came up a wet devil. I mean, went down a dry devil, came up a wet one. I mean, I'm saying there are clear-cut instructions in the Word, and you have to open the pages. You have to spend the time. You have to read the instructions. You have to read the manual. If we Before GPS and before all of this technology we have, we had what was called roadmaps. And people would go to the paper map and pull it out when they were traveling. And they would follow the map. When they didn't know where they were going, they would get that map out. And they would look at their landmarker, and they would follow that landmark, and they would get to their destination. It's the same way with the Word of God. We got a destination we're trying to reach, which is with our Lord and Savior. And the Bible is a clear-cut road map how to get there. Not what we think about it. And here's the simple. 
when you read things like what to say, and it is you and it in relation to our city, the heart and the wickedness of man that God is not pleased with. And if you go down that list, that hits everybody on the planet. And some it's like a scatter shot of a shotgun shell. It it it's a broad scope. It hits us. But when you see that one sin that identifies you, that's where we repent. And repent is not saying I'm sorry, uh, listening audience. Repent is turning from that thing and turning to righteousness. Okay, yes, I was. I hate it. Yes, I was impure. Yes, I had strife. Yes, I used to be jealous. I had all outbursts, anger, selfishness. I mean, the list goes on and on. Okay, what is the antidote to that? The fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Peace, love, joy, long-suffering, meekness, kindness. I mean, replace these things with what the Word of God says do. And I was told by someone, and I'm, I'm going to yield it back to you, uh, Brother Sean and Brother Anthony, but I was told, if you want Bible results, then do the Bible. If you want words, Amen. do the words. So That's if right. you want God to be pleased, do what God says. Not what you think is right, because the Scripture tells us plain, there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof, are the ways of death. And what is that death? Separation from God and losing your soul in a hell. And that's what we are striving not to do. But unfortunately, in order to make it into the kingdom of God, to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you're going to have to be able to do it well done. He's not just yes. going to tell you that. So he said, strive. Mm -hmm. He told us to strive. And what does strive mean? put forth some effort. So what I'm saying Amen. in a nutshell, God is just not going to open up the pearly gates and say, come on in. No, you got some work to do. <laughs> I have some work to do. We have work to do if we want to see him in peace. I Amen. Hope that and you know, Brother Chris, that helps a lot. And, you know, you talk about, I'm going to piggyback on your phrase, put forth some effort. You know, when you, relate, when you read Galatians 5, 17 through 21, it says, you know, the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity. I and mean, the first thing he, things he says have to do with sexual sins. So when you put forth some effort, sometimes the Holy Spirit will teach you some practical things. If you ask him, well, how can I avoid falling into the trap? So I'm going to talk to men, but women, y'all need to listen to this too because we know in the church, in the body of Christ, that sexual impurity, pornography is pervasive. Let's just be honest. However, once we've gone to God and we say, God, you know, this is a sin that I know it, it's me bowing down, I'm being idolatrous, I'm feeding my flesh, and I'm yielding up uh, the, the righteousness you give me by sinning. What can I do in the natural to help myself to become, to starve the flesh? Well, I was telling somebody this week, we have to remember we have the world's most powerful device in our hand. It's a cell phone. But it's also a hand grenade. Holy Spirit just shared with me, he said, it's pretty simple. You have to make the decision to not impale yourself. Now, what does that mean? That means that the devices or the tools or the individuals or the places that lead you into sin, you have to, as Chris said, put forth the effort. What's the effort? Well, if you just keep passing by your favorite corner store to buy liquor, maybe you need to find a different way home. If at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock when everybody's asleep, you pull out your phone and you're visiting some website you shouldn't be, perhaps you should turn off your phone and put it in another part of the house. When we talk about God's willingness to help us in our walk with God, he's willing to give us the inner cleansing and cleanse us from and give us a clear conscience when we com completely confess our sins. But then what is my part? My part is to put forth whatever physical or emotional effort, and believe me, the flesh is going to cry, kick, and fall on the ground right. like a three-year-old. It always right. wants what it wants. 
and you have to get in the mirror sometime and say no, and you got to mean it. And if that means, guess what, I'm feeling tempted, I need to take this phone and turn it off, or guess what, y'all, let's go sit and let's go to the living room and watch a movie, family time. You have to physically put yourself in a position to not sin sometime. That's some of that put forth the effort. So I really appreciate what you said, Brother Chris. You know, and, and I thank both of y'all for that because, you know, it is, we have to understand that for me to please God, that I must obey him. I must trust him. I must hunger for him. I must want to choose to do right. And so, I th- I so you know, Sister Linda told us when I subscribe as one of our dear friends, I was talking to her this past weekend, and she was talking about that where God has her at right now is that it's like a bow and arrow who he's pulling the string back. And sometimes, you know, in order for us to go forward, sometimes it requires us to go back. And unfortunately, we look at going back as a negative thing. I just quickly tag this thing. I remember when I was young in my early 20s, um, one of my favorite cars, I just loved it. I just like us. It was different. I love saws. Uh, so, you know, we were talking about back in the 80s. I mean, I love that egg shape or whatever the one it was. So I was seeing this young lady, and my soft had everything that I needed, but she was driving an older Mustang that was like a 1978 Mustang, and it did not have heat or AC. So one day I said, well, listen, you know, it was getting cold. I said, well, listen, why don't you take my car and I'll drive your car? And so one day I was going out to the parking lot at the apartment complex to get in the car, and somebody said, like, oh, you're going back. You're falling back. I'm like, well, no. I said, my girlfriend, I'd rather ride this so that she can be warm. But see, sometimes that when God is looking to propel us forward, it's required for us to be drawn back. And when God is drawing us back, it requires a lot of tension. As Sister Linda was sharing with me, the more tension that is put on the boy and arrow string, watch this now, when God is ready to release me, the further I will go. So let me just um, take a little moment with this, if you all don't mind, brothers, because as you all were talking, the Lord just began to share with me. Let's be very clear clear what sin is. Sin is being opposed to the righteousness of God. Sin hates everything that is right about God. Let's be very clear. God says you cannot. My sin nature says I want to and I will. God says, well, if you do, there are consequences. My sin nature says I don't care. As Brother Sean said, I have a temper tantrum to get my way. And what I've learned about God, that God will allow me to have what I want, even if it's to my demise, because he's not going to fight me to do what is right. Um, One sister told me yesterday, we can bow our head willingly or God will bow it for us. And she said, I'd rather bow it willingly than to have God put his hands on me. So when I'm looking at this sin nature, and brothers, you all already danced on it with, on the dance floor. But you have to understand something. It is natural for me to lust to do what is wrong because my sin mm-hmm. nature that is opposed to God desires to do whatever I want to do when I feel like doing it without anyone placing constraints and restraints on how often I want to do it. And so just to make it bare bone, because we're using scripture that is letting us know that, that as Brother Sean says, sexual mortality, and he touched on some things. Let's be very clear. My sin nature, the things that hate God because I can't do it freely, because my sin nature desires to do it without me thinking about it, it employs itself without me thinking about Listen, pornography, thinking about who you can hook up with. How -hmm. can I get over on somebody to get what I want? Uh, Who do I need to undercut in order so it can look like I did all the work even though I didn't do anything? Um, I I tell you what, uh, I lie constantly. Uh, hey, I don't mind having a, a, an affair because people say that if, if I'm not getting my needs met at home, then look on the outside and go get it. We're talking about the sin nature of man that hates everything that says you shouldn't be doing it. So broad is the way, and that's what we have taken this walk with Christ. We have made it too broad for people to pick and choose what they want God to be pleased with what, what they're doing. Well, I'm here to tell you, as Brother Chris has been saying about a, a roadmap, that's what the 
Bible is. I'm here to tell you that God loves us, and yes, he will accept us the way we are, but that doesn't mean that I can do anything. That acceptance means that, God, if I'm coming to you broken and being down and battered, you'll accept me. Absolutely. It doesn't mean that you can continue in sin, and I accept that and be okay. I think Scripture in Galatians says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can those of us who have been freed from sin live in it any longer? So thank you, Brother Sean, for being willing to start with the normal because in order for us to embrace this new walk, this new life that we as believers have that is rich and full and having God with us is that we must identify why Christ came and did that miraculous work on the cross because you cannot talk about the great works and the fruit of being in Christ without addressing sin. Amen. And this, what you know, we as believers, we have to be, I have to be mindful of it. Brother Sean has to be mindful. Of it. Brother Chris has to be mindful of it. We, matter of fact, I just make this thing very plain and simple. I was on a, um, a, a conference call today, and I had some things that information was given to me by my employees and people I work with, and it wasn't very clear. I'm the type of person that if you're going to give me something to do, I need to have clarity on what it is that you need for me to do because when I put my hands on something, I want to do it with excellency. So I asked them, I said, well, I need some clarity. What is this about? Well, I was already frustrated because I was trying to work on something that I had no knowledge really of what it was, but I came across very sharp. Now, my frustrations does not give me the right to come across sharp. Let's be very clear. So when I finished talking, the Holy Spirit began to minister to me, you need to apologize. And I said, y'all, I would like to, I'm sorry for how I spoke. Yes, I was passionate, but I'm sorry. My director said, thank you, Anthony. Because even though I was given information that wasn't right, and wasn't conveyed properly so I can do it effectively, there's still a standard that God holds me to as a believer on how to communicate or to articulate. And as I told my wife, hey, he's still doing work on me. Ladies and gentlemen, I have not arrived. I still struggle with this old sin nature that tells me that if they don't do what is right by you, then you just voice that you said, Brother Sean, if you're still reacting the way you used to react at 5 or 10, even though you didn't use the word, that's a problem. But I thank God that he convicted me. I received the conviction, asked for his forgiveness, and I had no problem with going to them and saying, I'm sorry. That's the life of working and walking out this salvation. And I close with this. He says, he has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what do the Lord require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. If we can employ those three critical aspects amongst others, then we will be on the right roadmap to pleasing our Lord in this new walk whereby our sin nature will begin to be crucified in the new life in Christ by the living of the Holy Spirit will guide us into righteousness. Thank y'all for giving me room to talk. <laughs> well, 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 brother, amen for that. And what you did is you executed fully Second Second Corinthians thirteen five. In that moment, in that work environment, you examine yourself. Yes, and that's yes. all. We, that's all. That's all that we all get to do. We all get the opportunity every single day to examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. Not if you have faith. That's a whole other conversation. To be in the faith is to examine your heart to prove your own selves. Earlier in this conversation, uh, Anthony mentioned something about people saying, well, how can you judge? We can't tell me if I'm saved or not. But you know who can, you know who can tell you if you're saved or not? You. Know ye not your, your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate. So the word says that we are to examine ourselves. Now, there's some good news, and I'm going to close on this, and I'm going to let Chris close on something, whatever he feels <laughs> like he wants to close on. Here's the good news. You know, we start, we're talking about Titus 3, three. Well, Titus 3, 4, and 5 says this. But after the kindness and the love of our God and Savior towards man appeared, yeah. not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's the behavior that we've been redeemed from. God, in his mercy, gave us the ability to receive forgiveness of our sins. The whole purpose of the normal is, is the, the moment you, be, you realize 
this how sinful you are, the yeah. scriptures and the Lord God will open himself up to you. But yeah. inside of us, we have all got to say no to that little defense attorney that's always trying to tell us inside that we're not that bad. I'm here to tell you, we are. Right. And that's, why, <laughs> and that's why Jesus died on the cross so he can forgive us of our sins. Jesus didn't actually die for us to have eternal life because whether you believe him or not, you will have eternal life. You will either spend it with him or you'll spend it in hell. He died to forgive us of our sins so that we can spend eternity with him in his paradise and in his kingdom. And I'll yield to Brother Chris. I tell you, Brother Sean, we could have just, as they say, dropped the mic on that. And, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> the audience, if you have time to to add to the um, conglomerate of scriptures, Galatians five sixteen through 18, because it let us know very well that we are in a spiritual battle, and it tells us that if we walk in the spirit, we should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust uh, in the spirit and the flesh, they lust against each other. And there is a war between the two. But thank God for the Holy Ghost down on the inside of us. That greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. And we have to understand that we walk, eat, sleep with the enemy. I've heard Brother Hall say that all the time, and that's our flesh, that we're going to continually be battling against our sinful nature and our desires because um, i never forget when I first got saved, that was a big battle for me because here I am. I wanted to do right with God, I wanted, and, and it still is because I'm still in my flesh. I'm still walking here on this earth, and it's not going to go away until Jesus comes and get us and redeems yes. us until we die. So with that being said, I want the listening audience to know that in the Word of God, we have a hiding place, that we can do this, we can live right, we can walk up right before God. And there is a such thing as a place in Him to where He is pleased with our life. But we have to trust Him to do just what He said He would do in His Word. And I'm going to say this, and I, I close with this. Jesus said it plain, why call me Lord and don't do what I say? If you're going to call Jesus Lord of your life, then simply obey him. Just do what he tells you to do. And you won't have any problem with him, and he won't have any problem with you. But the problem comes in is when your will clashes with his will, and you give in to your own will. And an old man told me, and I'll be done, he asked me one time, he said, name a sin. He said, I give you everything I own. If you name one sin that you got to do, not have done, but you have to do it. And I thought about that thing, and I said, you know what? There's none that I got to do. Every mm. sin that I do is because I wanted to do it. So mm. keep that in your mind. Mm. There's no sin yeah. you got to do. Yeah. And let's please the Lord and be ready for his return. I'm done. Yes. Well, I think... We have concluded as best as we could this topic of what's normal or that's normal. And I know that we'll come back in the second podcast and we're going to get into what's normal as a believer and how to deal with the trials and tribulations and some overcoming strategies from the Word of God that will help you deal with sin, Satan, and your flesh. So it's my pleasure, Brother Anthony. Thank you so much for taking time out. My brothers sacrificed their lunch hour today. So God bless you for that. And we're going to come back in part two with That's Normal, Expect Trials and Tribulations, and we certainly hope that you'll join us and share the good word. And as always, thank you for listening to Dr. Forensics. Thank you for sharing the content and material. We love your comment. And if you have questions collectively as a team, we will go to the Word of God and try to help you find the answer. In Jesus' name. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Thank you.